All right, welcome everybody. My name is Doug, and this is a webinar Steiner Business Solutions is putting on uh, as a guide to 1099s. I'm going to explain a little bit uh, what they're for, who has to file them, um, who doesn't, and then I'm going to go into how you can actually file them through QuickBooks. So there's a, just some instructional stuff and basic general knowledge about the 1099s themselves, but then I'm also going to go into the QuickBooks. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to, to file them, but QuickBooks is, is one way. You can actually print them right out of there. And if you're already doing your bookkeeping in QuickBooks, then that makes it really simple for you. So let's go ahead and pull up a 1099 here. All right, so the purpose of a 1099 form is basically um, for companies to report what they've paid to other subcontractors, uh, whether they're individuals or companies um, that subcontracted services to. And this is basically a double check for the, the IRS to make sure that those companies are reporting their income. So similar to the W-2s, how um, the W-2s are sent out for employees of companies, this is what you do for 1099s, you do these for subcontractors. Um, they can, the subcontractors can then use these 1099s to help prepare their own personal tax returns. And like I said, you're sending copies of these to the IRS as well, so the IRS knows what you've paid to the subs. Basically, the rules are this. Um, these are who would qualify for a 1099 if you're looking at your vendors. Um, at least $10 in royalties were paid to them, uh, broker payments in lieu of dividends or tax exempt interest. Not one that's used a lot. These are used a little bit more. At least if you've paid your vendor at least $600 in rents, that's a very important one, uh, services performed by someone who is not your employee, again that could be a business or it could be an individual, prizes and awards, now there's an other income payment category which includes a bunch of little things that are not used very much. Another one is medical and health care payments. Now this is not health care premiums. These would be payments directly to doctors, physician offices, hospitals, that kind of thing for specific services, not for insurance, health insurance premiums. Um, over $600 in crop insurance proceeds, and another one not used very much. Um, cash payments for fish, another one not used very much. And finally, payments to an attorney. So if you paid an attorney over $600, um, you need to file a 1099 for them. So that's, if you have any of those, if any of your vendors you paid $600 or more to in a year, they fall into one of those categories, you're probably going to have to do a 1099 for them. Now, let's go over some exclusions to those examples. Generally, a payment to a corporation, which would include an LLC that files as an S Corp or a C Corp, you would not have to file for. So if you happen to know that the company is incorporated, uh, they're an S Corp or C Corp, or if you know that they're an LLC business, but they file as an S Corp or C Corp, then you do not have to do a 1099. Now, I'll, I'll warn you off the top here that it's, it's better to be safe than sorry. So if you're not sure if they're supposed to get a 1099, it's better to just send them one because they can always just rip it up and throw it away. But if you didn't file one when you were supposed to, then that's where you could potentially get into trouble. So always err on the side of sending up a 1099 if you're not sure. Um, another exclusion would be payments for merchandise. So again, the, the, the key here is that these, the, the payments that you're recording and you're using for this calculation, these 1099s, are for services not products. If you buy products from an individual, it's not going to count. But if you bought a service from an individual, then you would count it. Um, another exclusion, obviously, is wages paid to employees. That's what the W-2s are for. Um, you would not do any employee reimbursements on 1099s. And then finally, payments to tax-exempt organizations. Um, you would not need to do 1099s for them as well. Um, so, then we talked about the uh, some of the corporations getting excluded. If it's a corporation, you don't have to do a 1099. Well, there's actually exclusions to that exclusion, if you will, as well. Um, and I make it nice and complicated for you. So even if a company is a corporation, you would still 
send them a 1099 for these reasons. Uh, one, if if you're uh, paying, if you paid them rent, rent would still you'd still send a 1099. Medical and healthcare payments that go here in box six. Um, again, these are not healthcare insurance premiums. These are actual healthcare costs that you would be paying to a doctor or a hospital, or something like that. So even if they are a corporation, you would still send them a 1099. Uh, fish purchases for cash reported doesn't matter whether they're incorporated or not you'd still send them one attorney's fees again this is another one that might be somewhat common if you paid over six hundred dollars in attorney's fees you have to send them a 1099 whether they're incorporated whether they're a corporation or not uh, and then gross proceeds paid to an attorney reported in box 14 down here is a, is a different thing we'll talk more about that as well again the, the exclusion for the company being incorporated does not count there. Um, so let, let me talk a little bit more about that gross proceeds paid to an attorney. Those are basically payments made to an attorney in the course of your trade or business in connection with legal services. Uh, for example, settlement agreement. If they total 600 or more, then you're going to put that down here in this box. Um, again, so what we're talking about here, we're not talking about fees like uh, you pay to an attorney. For services because that would go up here in, in box 7 but we're talking about settlement costs so if you had to pay out you know uh, on a lawsuit that you lost and you had to pay out funds uh, and to the to the claimant uh, but you would pay them to the attorney's office so that the attorney could pay the claimant that's what we're talking about here in, in box 14 all right um, so another exclusion is, again, I mentioned pretty much anything that you pay an employee, you're not going to count. So um, do not count uh, reimbursed expenses to employees either on your 1099s. That, those actually don't need to be filed anywhere. Um, but most of your employee uh, compensation, that's all going to be on your W-2. Um, but employee business expenses, reimbursements, would not have to be on a 1099 or a W-2. Um, so here is your 1099 form. This first box here basically is uh, is, is going to be your company's name and address because you are the payer. Um, here's your payer federal ID number that goes in this box. Now here's the recipient who you're sending it to. It would be your, your vendor typically. Um, it's going to be their ID number here, whether it's a social security number or whether it's a, a federal ID number. And you've got the recipient's name here and any DBA that they may work under uh, their address here. That's what you're going to fill out there. One note I want to make is uh, you're, going to, you're going to send a copy of the 1099, you're going to typically the, the black copy, which I believe is copy B, um, to the actual recipient, to the vendor who you've made the payments to over the years. You're going to send it to them by the end of January. Now, you are allowed to truncate their federal ID number or their social security number if you want on the copy that you send to them. So in other words, if it's their social security number, you could um, include just the last four digits on here if you wanted to. But you're also going to send a copy of all of these to the IRS and you are not allowed to truncate that. So um, if you're printing this out of QuickBooks or something like that, chances are they don't even need to give you the option truncated. I'm just letting you know. You can you're, you know, you're able to manually fill out these forms if you want to. You don't have to use a computer program to do it. So if that's the case, uh, you can truncate that number if you think that they would prefer that. Um, another thing I want to point out is you'll see uh, a void box and a corrected box up here. The void box, and again, these are only going to be for the IRS copy that you're going to send. Typically, the, the copy that you send to the IRS is going to be red whereas the other copies are going to be black. And the other copies um, will typically, you, you can buy these forms at Staples, Office Max, you can order them on Amazon, you can get them a lot of places. Um, they're going to come with two of these forms per page. So an 8.5 by 11 page is going to have two of these forms. The IRS copies, um, you're not supposed to fold or bend or anything or cut those copies, but the black copy that you'd be sending out, they're going to come with two per page so you're able to um, actually they're usually perforated so you're able to rip them right down the middle and then use one half the page 
uh, for one customer and one uh, or for one vendor, and the bottom half for another, and send them out that way. So on the red copies, uh, if by chance when you print out your 1099, the 1099 is uh, not correct, something's wrong with it, and you know it right away. So let's say you know one of the 1099s on your eight eight and a half by eleven page are wrong, but the other one is good. What you do is go ahead and mark this void. You mark this void on that, and that way the IRS will not just won't count it. It will ignore this the entire 1099, not the entire page, but the 1099 on that uh, that's marked void. Um, likewise, if you've already sent everything into the IRS and then you find out later you needed to correct something, what you would do is send in another form and you would mark it corrected, and that way it knows that you've already IRS knows that you've already sent this 1099 in before, but now you're sending in a corrected version of it. Um, okay, so that's kind of the, the basics of the 1099. Um, let's start going through the actual fields here and talking about what they're for. First one is rents. So this is fairly self-explanatory. Again, any rent that you've paid over $600, so things that would count here uh, would be um, you know, any rent for office buildings that you've rented, office space that you've rented. It would also include machine rental. So if, you, if you've if you rented equipment over the year um, and it amounts to more than $600, you would include that here in this rent box as well. Number two is royalties. Not one that's used a lot, but I'll just briefly go over that. It's, here you would enter gross royalty payments of $10 or more, which are typically from royalties from gas, oil, other mineral properties, things like that. So it's not one that a lot of people use. Other income, um, basically the, you know, the instructions from the IRS for the other income box here say that it, it, you put anything here that does not fall into any of the other categories. So that's not real helpful. Um, but it can include certain prize awards that are not for services performed and things like that. Again, when it's not used very often. Um, Box four is for federal income withheld. Now, the government requires that if if you have a, a subcontractor you know is going to be a 1099 vendor, um, and you know you're going to have to fill out a 1099 for them, and they do not give you their federal ID number, um, if you don't have that information, then you are expected to withhold a certain amount of money out of it, just like you would withhold money from an employee's paycheck. And turn that money into the government. You expect them to do that as well. I'm not going to go into that too much. There, are, you know, I would suggest you download the instructions from the IRS to find out more about how much you're supposed to withhold. Um, I want, I want to say it's somewhere around 20%, something to that effect. But basically, the, the IRS is expecting that if you don't have their federal ID number, that means you're not going to be able to properly report this income to them at the end of the year. So what they expect is that they want you to take out 20% of that payment. So if you owe them um, $600, you would actually withhold 120 of it and pay them the balance. And you'd hold that $120 and uh, turn it into the IRS at the end of the year. You know, a lot of people don't really do that, but that's, that's the law. That's what's supposed to happen. And the good thing is, is you can actually use that to your benefit because um, you know, if, if you have any subcontractors or any of these uh, uh, companies you're working with that you know you're going to have to do a 1099 for, and they're withholding the information or they're they're just slow to respond to you. You're trying to get their address. You're trying to get their federal ID number from them, and they're just not responding quickly. Um, what I suggest doing is trying to get this information before you even pay them. And we're going to go over the W-9 form later. I'm going to show you that. And that's a good form that you can give them, blank form. To fill out, and it gives you all of this information that you need: their name, their address, their federal ID number, uh, what type of business they are, whether they're incorporated or not. Um, what I would suggest is you actually give that to them and have them fill it out and say, "We'll give you your check and your payment once you give me this W-9 back with all this information." Um, and what you can do is actually say, "Look, if you don't give me this information, then I'm going to have to withhold 20% from your next check." Okay, so you can use that as a little leverage on your side. Get them to give you the information you need because that's really all you want. You just want them to give you the information so that you can fill out the forms properly and do what you're supposed to do uh, as, a, as a company. So that's what that is. Again, for more information, I would I would look up their instructions uh, online to find out more of how much you're supposed to withhold. 
And five is fishing boat proceeds. I'm not really going to go into that because too many, not too many people use that. Number six is medical and healthcare payments. So it says, enter payments of 600 or more made in the course of your trade or business to each physician or other supplier or provider of medical or healthcare services. So again, I mentioned this earlier, but uh, this is not health insurance premiums. So you do not put health insurance premiums here. This would only be if you actually paid a physician, a hospital, a doctor's office, or something like that directly for medical care. If it was over $600, then you would include that here. All right. <clears throat> now we move on to box seven, and this is this is the one where most of your stuff is going to get filled out. The box seven called non-employee compensation. You're going to enter non-employee compensation of $600 or more. Include fees, commissions. For services performed as a non-employee. So what is non-employee compensation? Basically if the, the following four conditions are met you must report the payment here in non-employee compensation. One, you made the payment to someone who is not your employee. Two, you made the payment for services in the course of your trade or business, normal business payments. Three, you made the payment to an individual partnership, a state, or in some cases a corporation. We talked about the, what qualifies for the business types a minute ago. And uh, four, you made the payments to the payees of at least $600 during the year. Again, we're talking about calendar year, so all this is always we're dealing with calendar year, even if you're on a different fiscal year for your business. The 1099s, just like W-2s, they are they work on a calendar year. Um, Fees paid by one professional to another, such as fee splitting or referral fees, those are, those are, uh, that would be considered non employee compensation. Payments by attorneys to witnesses or experts in legal, legal proceedings, that would count. Payments for services, including payments for parts or materials used to perform the services if supplying the parts or material was incidental to the service. So, for example, if you were paying an auto shop to fix your car, um, they may give you an invoice that includes parts and labor. Well, in this case, uh, the parts are really incidental to repairing your car. You're paying them to fix your car. You know, whether they want to charge, you know, whatever the part is for labor or whatever for parts, it doesn't matter to you. Now, if you went to an auto supply store and you just bought some parts to fix the car yourself, well, that would not count because that would be considered product or merchandise that would not be considered a service um, so here you're looking at typically uh, fees for attorneys accountants architects contracts engineers uh, companies and people like that who are providing a service to you that's that's the one you're going to use the most box seven is when where most of your uh, filings are going to go uh, because that's what we use most of our lenders for um, oh, actually, there's one more thing for box seven too. Exchange. This is one that's not not used very often, and, and one that's probably avoided by a lot of businesses. Um, but legally, this is you're supposed to report this. Exchanges of services between individuals in the course of their trade or business. So, for example, if an attorney represents a payment for some of some of the painter's business. And in exchange, the painter paints the attorney's office. Well, each each one is supposed to value their services and do a 1099 for the other. Again, if it, if it goes over $600. So whatever the attorney valued his services at, he would have to do a 1099 to the painter for that amount. And conversely, the painter would have to value his services and decide how much he thinks painting an office is worth, and he would do a 1099 to the to the attorney for that amount. So this is not something that gets done a lot. You know, this would be one of those transactions a lot of people would do under the table. But again, legally, you are supposed to do this. And yes, if you do that, then whoever receives the 1099 is going to have to pay income tax on that. So that you know, the the attorney would have to show um, the value of, of his office being painted. He'd have to add that to his taxes, and he have to pay income tax on. That's the point of it. So again, you can see why a lot of people would not do that. But legally, you are supposed to do that. Um, <clears throat> number eight, again, another one not used very much, substitute payments in lieu of dividends. 
Here you enter aggregate payments of at least $10 received by a broker for a customer in lieu of dividends or tax exempt interest in it as a result of the loan of the customer securities. So I'm not going to go into a lot of that because again it's not used very much. Box 9. Payer made direct sales on 5,000 or more of consumer products to a buyer. Again, not, not used very much, so I'm not going to really spend a lot of time on that. Um, but basically, you know, if you sold $5,000 or more of consumer products to a person on a buy, sell, deposit commission, or other commission basis for resale anywhere other than a permanent retail establishment, that's, that's what the rules are for that one. Um, but, you know, most people don't use it, so I'm not going to go into it. Crop insurance proceeds, somewhat self-explanatory, not used much, so I'm not going to really go into that either. Uh, excess gold and parachute payments, same thing, not going to really go into that. Um, gross proceeds to an attorney, I touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, here you're going to enter gross proceeds of $600 or more paid to an attorney in connection with legal services, regardless of whether the services are performed for the lawyer. So again, this is typically, you know, a good example of this is a settlement. If you had to pay, uh, you had to settle a lawsuit and you paid the money to the attorney so that they could give the money to the, uh, to the plaintiff, then, then you're going to have to report that here and send the 1099 to the attorney's office. All right. So these other ones, again, 15, 16, 17, not used very much. Uh, I will, I will point out that, um, the states are a little bit different whether or not you have to actually submit the 1099s to your state. In Virginia, where we're located, you do not have to file the 1099s with the state of Virginia. You just file them with the, uh, with the recipient and then with the IRS. Other states, you may have to do that. So you would look, you would look into your own state whether or not you're supposed to file it with the state. But in Virginia, you do not have to. So that is pretty much this form. Again, uh, you need to fill this out and submit it to the recipient, the person who you paid the money to, by January 31st, the end of every year. Um, and then you need to s submit it to the IRS by February 28th. Um, or if, if you, that's if you paper file with the IRS. If you actually file electronically, there are ways to actually do this electronically through other services paid services and you'll see QuickBooks even has that service as well offered as well as other softwares and companies websites out there that will file this stuff electronically for you some some payroll companies will even do that for you as well um, if you file electronically then you actually have till March 31st to file it but for most people you have to file it with the IRS by the end of February and you know a good tip you, you could technically file everything with the IRS as soon as you file it with the recipient and when you send everything out to all your 1099 vendors you can turn right around and submit everything to the IRS if you want, but I suggest you wait a couple of weeks at least because sometimes you will hear from uh, one of your 1099 vendors after they receive theirs and say, hey, you put my, the wrong federal ID number on here, or I'm disputing this amount, you know, I showed something different, uh, or you have the wrong address, or something like that, and then you'd want to correct it. Um, you know, if you've, already, if you've only <clears throat> submitted the copy to your vendor, and you need to do a correction, you can always just rip that one up and do another one and send it to them. Um, but if you've already submitted it to the IRS, then you actually need to send a whole corrected form. Um, and you need to send another 1096 as well. So the 1096 is kind of the cover sheet um, that you would send to the IRS. So I typically would wait a couple weeks, at least a couple weeks, uh, to the middle of February or something, before you submit everything to the IRS, just to make sure that there's nothing that you needed to correct. Um, then you're going to print out a 1096 form, which I, I don't have a copy here, but uh, it's basically, like I said, a cover sheet that says how many 1099s are, are attached and the total amount for those 1099s. Um, you're going to send that along with all the red copies of the 1099s, not folded or bent in any way or state or anything, submit that to the IRS by the end of February. Okay? So that is the 1099 form. Now, as I mentioned earlier, you need to get this information to be able to fill it out from your, from your vendor. Um, you need a social security number, you need their name, their full business name, you need to know what type of entity they are, and you need their address. So, <clears throat> you know, you can get that information 
by phone, by email, um, really any way you want. But what I suggest you do is use the W9 form. You can download this right from the IRS website. And basically, this, this is exactly what this form is for, it's requesting for the taxpayer's identification and certification number. Um, so it, it asks them for their name, uh, their any DBAs that they have. It asks them for the type of business that they are, you know, whether it's sole proprietor, sole proprietor, C corp, S corp, partnership, trust, uh, limited liability company. Here's where we talked about, you know, a limited liability company. You would typically you would need to do a 1099 form if they're if they're sole proprietor or if they're a partnership. But if they're a C corp, if they file as a C corp or S corp, which they would put here, then you do not need to do a 1099. So you want to get all this information and you can have it on file. Even if you get this information and it comes back and it shows that they were a C-Corp, well now you don't need to do a 1099, but you can still keep this document on file so that you have records as to why you didn't do a 1099 form. You'll have it for the next year. If you ever did get audited and the company came in and said, why didn't you do, you know, the IRS says, why didn't you do a 1099 for them? You say, well, here, because they filled out this form that said that they were a C-Corp. So I didn't do a 1099. There you go, you have the documentation uh, as to why you did what you did. Um, it's got their address down here, and then over here you're going to have your social security number if it's an individual or your employer ID number if it's a business. So this, this is the form. Again, I encourage you to get this as soon as possible. A lot of people wait till the end of the year to go try to get this information, and then they're trying to track down their vendors and trying to get this information, uh, and it delays them. Um, putting together the 1099s, whereas if you can, again, like I said, you can email this to your vendors, you can hand it to them and say, fill this out, and then I'll give you your payment, your check payment, as soon as you give this back to me, um, that's probably your best bet. I mean, they're, they're likely to be much more responsive if they're waiting on payment and they know that that's what's going gonna, gonna to take to get paid, versus the end of the year when you've already paid them everything and maybe you're not even doing business with them anymore, and now you're going to try to get information from them. And they may not be very responsive. So that's the W-9 form. Again, if you go to the irs.gov, their website, and just do a search from W-9, you can download this and fill that out. All right, so that's the W-9, that's the 1099. Now I'm going to show you how we can actually use these QuickBooks. So if you're already doing your bookkeeping, you know, if you're not doing your bookkeeping in QuickBooks, there are ways to, uh, there are plenty of services out to do this. You can go to Staples and just buy these, these 1099 forms and you can fill them out manually. You can add everything up that you paid these vendors and, and fill them out manually. That, that's fine too. But if you are already doing your bookkeeping in QuickBooks, then a lot of this information is already there for you. And, you know, if you've kept it up throughout the year, then you can almost literally go in and just push a button and have these print out for you and uh, save you a lot of time. So first thing I want to show you is, is uh, what you can do if you go into the vendor center. When you're setting up a vendor, if you know or suspect that they're going to be a 1099 vendor that you're going to have to prepare a 1099 form at the end of the year, you can, in the setup process, you can make sure that you've got all the information you need, name, address, down here. When you go into tax settings, you can. This is where you can put in the tax ID number again, whether it's a social security number or a federal ID number for a business. Either way, and then you check this box saying that they're eligible for 1099. So again, it's just a way of QuickBooks tracking that information um, so that you can print this report later. You can print the uh, the 1099 report. So that's how you would do that on setup or. You know, if it's after the fact, you're getting this information, this is where you go, go back to the vendor, open the vendor up and edit them, and then you can enter that information. Um, but once it's the end of the year and you're ready to actually start preparing your 1099s and trying to decide who you need to uh, send them to, you, you go under vendors, there's an option here for print and e-file 1099. And there's a little wizard here that'll walk you right through the whole, the whole step, the whole process, I mean. So we're going to open the wizard. And this shows you the different steps that we're going to go through. First, we're going to select the vendors that we think are appropriate and verify that their information is correct. And we're going to map accounts in QuickBooks so that it goes to the right box on the, the 1099 report. 
uh, we're going to review it and then we're going to confirm everything and print it. Let's get started. The first thing it's going to do is show me a list of all my vendors. These are all my vendors in the system and you'll see there are checkboxes next to the ones who are already set up as 1099 vendors. So these, you know, when we set them up in the sample company, we already decided they were 1099 vendors and we checked the little box in the, in the vendor setup that says 1099 vendor. But it is showing us a list of all of the other vendors that we have as well, just in case. And look at these and say, oh, maybe we missed one. Maybe, maybe uh, Mendoza Mechanical should have been one. I, mean, I didn't check it, but I can do that now. I can turn them on as a 1099 vendor right here. And, and QuickBooks tries to help you a little bit by showing you up to the right here which GL accounts were typically used for that vendor. So that can give you an idea of what kind of stuff you paid them for, too. So in this case, tools and miscellaneous equipment, well, no, if we bought equipment from them, then they, they're not going to count uh, as a 1099 vendor. Um, but if I go up here and say advertising, yes, well, advertising, legal, yes, I should be doing that. And we can look down here and see if there's any others that, that make it out. None of these are obvious by the, by the GL account anyway that, that they should be a 1099 vendor. But you have the opportunity here to, to change them to 1099 vendors. Uh, once you've selected everybody, uh, then you can always go back. We're not, at this point, we haven't even gotten to looking at how much we've paid these vendors. We're just deciding whether they should even be a 1099 vendor at all. So we continue. Now it's going to bring up all those vendors that we checked. It's going to bring up all their information to make sure we're not missing anything. And as you can see, for some of these here, we are. So it's got nice big highlighted red boxes to show us that we're missing federal ID numbers for these particular vendors. So we know we've got to go get that information. Now, if we happen to have it in front of us, we can double click on it here and we can enter it right here. Or you can you know, close out of here and actually go into the vendor setup screen uh, and enter it there as well. So that's where you would do put that right here. We'll hit continue. Even though we're missing some of that information, we can it'll still let us continue on if you want. It'll let you print out the 1099s without the federal ID numbers on it. Uh, it's not going to prevent you. It's going to warn you, but it won't prevent you. Um, you know, and if that's the case, then then you would still want to do that. You know, I would don't don't not submit a 1099 to the IRS just because you don't have the ID number. You need to do your the best you can to try to get that ID number. But if the vendor becomes unresponsive, like I said, if for example, it's a you know, company you don't do work with anymore and they just aren't returning your calls or emails and you can't get the federal ID number for them, well, then submit the 1099 without the federal ID number. At least you're doing the best you could um, to submit that information. Don't, don't use that as an excuse to not even submit it at all because um, that could come back to bite you. All right, so then on this screen, this is where the opportunity to map the different GL accounts to the different boxes on the, uh, the 1099 form. So again, as I said, in most cases you're going to be, things are going to be going to the non-employee compensation box 7 on the 1099. But things like rent, rent, we don't want to omit that, we want it to go to box 1, rent on the 1099. We say legal, same thing. Legal should be going to box 7, non-employee compensation. Fountains and garden lighting, if that's, if that's product, if, if we book in this GL account, uh, mostly merchandise purchases, then we want to admit that, omit, excuse me, omit that account from uh, being counted towards the 1099 totals. Subcontractors, that should definitely be counted as non-employee compensation. And plants and sod, again, that's merchandise, that's product. That wouldn't be service, so we want those to be admitted, anything we book. For that account to be omitted. Decks and patios, in this case, I think this is considered labor. Um, so that you get the opportunity to go through here based on the accounts that are used on the vendors that we've selected with checks. This is QuickBooks is helping you narrow down exactly what you need to do, uh, exactly who you need to file for, and what needs to be included on those 1099. All right, so next we hit continue. Now we have the opportunity here to view included payments. So it's going to show me a report. Okay, now we've done all that filtering, decided which vendors we're going to use, which ones we're not, which 
accounts should count, which accounts shouldn't count towards the 1099s, it's going to give me this report. In this case, there aren't too many left, but we've got a, a couple payments to Salt Advertising. So 500 plus 120, that's 620, so that's over the $600. Uh, computer repair for uh, BJ, $600. And patio and desk designs, $1150. Again, the assumption here then is that these, this must be a service as opposed to uh, actual product that you purchased from them. So this just gives you one more opportunity to review things. Uh, make sure that this looks right to you. One more thing I want to point out is right here. It says if you made payments to vendors by debit cards, gift cards, or PayPal, uh, click View Included Payments and edit the check number field to include an appropriate notation so that QuickBooks can exclude these payments. If you paid any of these vendors with, with credit cards, debit cards, gift cards, or PayPal, <clears throat> excuse me, then you, you should not be including them on your 1099. The credit card companies, the banks, they are going to be submitting their own 1099s to those vendors. If you if you're a credit card uh, if you have a credit card merchant account, then you'll, you've probably seen that you get a, uh, a 1099 from your credit card merchant company at the end of the year. So any payments that go through them, they will take care of that as a 1099. You only count cash check payments, that kind of thing. So one thing QuickBooks uh, helps you out with is if you're familiar with the check field, uh, uh, the check number field on the check, if you're typically entering in your payments through bill payment or through write checks in QuickBooks, you'll notice there's a, uh, a check screen, a check number field. And where you would put the check number if there is a check number, but if there's a debit card transaction or a credit card, something like that, you wouldn't put, you may not put anything in there. Um, if you put any one of these keywords in there instead of a check number, QuickBooks knows to exclude those payments from the 1099 calculation. So if, if it was a debit card transaction, excuse me, you can just put debit in the, in the check number field and then it automatically knows, QuickBooks knows to not count that towards your 1099 calculation. And same thing for PayPal. That would be another good example of, of one that people pay vendors through PayPal maybe uh, instead of directly paying them. You want to make sure you're putting PayPal in there if you're, if you're using the right check or the bill payment screen in QuickBooks so that it doesn't include that. That's real important. And then you can also click on this if you want to to view uh, payments that were excluded. In this case, uh, there's nothing on this report, but anything that was excluded for any other filter reasons, that would show up here. All right, so we're feeling pretty confident. We're going to go to this next screen. It's going to show us a little summary. Uh, we're going to have three different 1099s here for these three vendors. It shows what box the amounts are going to go in and the total for the 1099. So everything's in this case all these three vendors are going to go into box seven. So if it continue. Here's where I was I mentioned a little bit earlier that you can um, Intuit actually offers a 1099 e-file service. You can go in here and actually file everything electronically and you still need to probably print everything out to send to the vendors the copy. But if you want to file it electronically to the IRS, then you don't have to print an extra copy and mail that in. You can do that. And of course they charge you for that service. I don't know what, what the rate is, but, but there's beat for that. Otherwise, you can go into print 1099s. <clears throat> if you've got the, the printable kind, you can stick these right in your printer and print them. It's going to ask you which calendar year are we looking at doing, because you could even go back to a previous year and redo them from the year before if you needed to. Put in the correct year, hit OK. It's going to bring up uh, all the vendors that you've chosen. Um, if you're going to print all of them, then you can do this. You can hit preview if you want, uh, or you hit print 1099s, which will actually print, print them right out of the printer. Print the 1096. Once it's time to actually submit it to the federal government, um, you're going to print a 1096. Again, that's the cover page, and that's a separate form that typically comes with your 1099 package. The 1096 should all come together. Um, you'll have one or two of those copies. Um, but you also have the ability to check and uncheck some. So let's say, you know, if you typically you're going to print all of them and send them out. It's going to be three of them for a total of 23, seven here. 
but let's say you just after you printed them out you realize the one for computer services was incorrect something was wrong about it well you can come back and just reprint that one if you want you don't have to reprint all of them but that's it and we'll I'll hit preview and I'll, I will show you if, if, if you do look at the preview now it's not going to look like form itself because what QuickBooks is expecting is that you're printing putting in these pre-printed forms into your printer so it's going to uh, put these all of these pieces of information into the correct box on the form but you have to have the form to see it so you can't just hit print on blank paper uh, and then expect to be able to submit the 10 on that way it doesn't work that way um, print it's just to preview the LSD print align another thing I want to show you if you get into your print print screen here you choose the printer that you want before you do that though if you want you can choose a line and print a sample 1099 and then it's just going to print a 1099 report with a bunch of X's and what you can do is you can actually hold that piece of paper up to a, a, an actual 1099 report and you hold it up to the light and see if everything lines up into the boxes the way it's supposed to but because based on you know what kind of printer you have and things like that the alignment might not be exactly right the first time so if it's not, I highly recommend you print the sample page first. Like I said, you can just hold it up to the to an actual 1099 form, hold it up to the light, and you can see whether it's fitting into the boxes the way it's supposed to. And if it doesn't, then you can adjust things vertically or horizontally by adjusting these fields here to go left, right, up, down, that kind of thing, and keep printing sample reports until it lines up the way it's supposed to. And then you leave those settings there. And then go ahead and print. So that is how you print them. Like I said, uh, the, the the copies that go to the vendors need to be done by January 31st. The copy it needs to go to the IRS. If it's a printed copy, it needs to be by February 28th. If it's an electronic copy, it can be done as late as uh, March 31st. That's how you do your 1099s in QuickBooks. But again, there are lots of different services out there. Uh, to do this, if you want to go through somebody else, you can. If you have a payroll company, they might even be able to do it for you. Um, you still would need to submit all this information. Certainly, if you do your bookkeeping in QuickBooks, this is going to be the by far the easiest way to do it is to, to do it right out of QuickBooks. But you can do them manually. You can find another service to do it, and submit that information to them, and they'll create the 1099s for you. Um, but now you know who has to file a 1099, when they have to file it, who doesn't have to file and uh, a couple ways to do it. Um, so I hope this was helpful. Um, please come back and check us out again. We're, we're doing webinars all the time on different things. Visit our YouTube page, Steiner Business Solutions. We have our own YouTube page. We put out, especially uh, for QuickBooks stuff, we're putting out videos, training videos, and, and tips and tricks on how to do things in QuickBooks all the time on YouTube. YouTube. If you subscribe to our YouTube page, uh, you'll be the first to see them when they come out. We put out new videos every month, and you'll we'll get an email letting you know that there's new ones out there for you to check out. Um, we're on LinkedIn. You can follow us there. Follow us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter. Twitter. We're all constantly trying to put out information to help small and mid-sized business, uh, whether it's QuickBooks or other consulting. Uh, we're always putting information, so please follow us and, and like us and all that good stuff. And uh, I hope this was helpful. Thanks.